I've never used one of these uh, over my shoulder kind of microphones before, so if I fade out, it's either because I had too much Italian food for supper or I've lost my communications. I've failed to do what we always teach at SAMS. I have failed to, one, figure out who the audience is, because nobody could tell me who the audience is going to be, and two, I've got way too many slides. So we'll start with the first slide. The soldier in the lower right corner is, I believe, from New Guinea in the early 1940s when we were attempting to uh, suppress the Japanese empire in the Pacific. But he is up there to remind all that the person who gets either positive or negative vibes from the training of their officers and the education of their officers are the private soldiers. And it is my contention that from our past, we can learn valuable lessons for the future. And one of the valuable lessons for the future, I believe, is what the big three outcomes were from the officer education system from 1920 to 1940. Competence, acknowledged competence on the part of the individual officer that they could do certain tasks, linked them then to an increased degree of confidence in their ability to do exactly that. And it was all based upon repetitive exercise of decision making on the part of the student officers. So that's really what we're here to talk about tonight. I wanted to set this in the right context by talking about establishing national defense and national security strategies. In 1920, they did it with a congressional act. Today, we're doing it. I'm not really sure how we're doing it. But here is what General Ordinaro thinks we should do for the future. any former infantrymen in the audience, please identify yourself so I can tell when your lips are moving, you've read the slide. <laughs> General Ordino's perspective here is that the budget, to a certain extent, drives reality, but his three major changes are something that would have been obvious to somebody in 1919, 1920 as well. That it's a focus on a certain form of warfare, Unfortunately, General Ordinero gives us about eight different forms of warfare to worry about. It's an issue of declining budgets, and it's a shift of emphasis. In 1930, this is what Major Frederick Pond thought was the purpose of an army. Major Pond's perspective is that the Army was an educational institute. And the reason he was able to say that in 1930 is that this is what the National Defense Act of 1920 did to the Army. Three tiers of readiness, something that we've been playing with off and on in the Army since 1945, were imposed upon the Army over the objections of almost everybody uh, who was a senior officer. What they wanted was universal military training, where every uh, male at the proper age would join the Army or Navy, Marines, for a certain number of months in order to receive universal military training, and then would go into some kind of reserve status. Instead, what the Congress gave us was under-equipped and undermanned regular force, and as I say up there, somebody's dream of what the organized reserve should be. We could do that in 1920 because we were still protected by the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. We could do that because we had significantly taken out the number of threats that we thought we faced, and most of our attention in the 20s and 30s from a real threat were based on Mexico. A very different perspective when you look at it from the perspective of 1919 looking forward. If you look at it from the perspective of 1945, it becomes obvious that our threats were Japan and Germany. Nothing could be, have been further from the truth in the early period of the interwar. And whatever we were provided for in terms of end strength in the Army, Congress repeatedly didn't give us enough money to do that. But the thing that was protected, because it was so cheap, was officer education. 
And just a few minutes to put in a little bit more context the experiences that brought this about from the perspective of the Army officers. When I was writing the acknowledgments portion of my book, something that came clear to me and I acknowledged in the acknowledgment section was that a friend of mine who helped me put together some of the core, uh, core ideas of the book, a guy named Paul Jacobsmeyer, what struck me was that he and I have known each other longer than the interwar period. And yet we still talk about when we were lieutenants together. Generational experiential learning. From a single generation, you went from Smokey Bear hats, firing single shot uh, Springfield rifles, and doing that kind of training to the assault on Omaha Beach. 22 years, 24 years, depending on what experiences on the left and the right you're looking at. But there's another aspect of that as well. Army officers, at least in the good old days, Army officers used to spend a lot of time at the club. They spent a lot of time at the club because the NCOs didn't want them around the units, because the NCOs wanted to run the units. But when they were in the club, the generation that fought the Philippines and World War I began to influence a younger generation who did not have that combat experience under their belt, but who themselves would end up in Vietnam. And when you begin to think about 20 or 30 year generational change, you begin to realize that what was learned in World War I was not just something forgotten when we started into World War II, but was part of the heart and soul of the officer corps. This is the experience from the World War. When I read this in Pershing's book, I found it a little hard to believe that you really needed that many trained general staff officers. We had about 9,000 commissioned officers in the Army at the start of World War I. Depending on who you count, we needed as many as 80,000 general staff or staff officers. So we had about a one in six ratio of what we needed versus what we had. In World War II, it's worse. In World War II, we go from 200,000 soldiers and about 15,000 to 19,000 officers to over 12 million in the military. That ratio is about 1 to 40. So you go from one officer standing in a room, the next picture is 40 officers standing in a room. Who do you think is going to be the one who influences those 39 new officers? It's going to be that single officer from the regular army also may explain some of the reliefs for cause that occurred in the National Guard. Maybe. Still haven't figured that one out yet. The cauldron of World War I. European historians don't think much of the U.S. entry into World War I. They don't think it mattered very much. But the American people in September, October, and early November of 1918, the American people saw 20,000 American soldiers killed in a single battle. About 400 a day. And it gives you pause to reflect on what happens today when 10 soldiers get killed in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. We were losing in World War I, 400 a day. And oh, by the way, that's just in the Meuse Argonne. There are other active theaters or active parts of the defensive system where we're losing soldiers as well. And we're employing more than 13 divisions, five or six corps, depending on what you count, and we get two, three field armies. The third field army ends up in the occupation of Germany. The second field army ends up at the Samahel area, holding it while we attack with the first army in Musargon. None of those formations existed before World War I. And I think when I write book number two, I'm going to have to talk about the difference between the division that Pershing commanded in the punitive expedition and a real division. Makes for some interesting stories to tell 
as you go through that. This is a cauldron, and the American Army Officer Corps learned some lessons from this thing. Unfortunately, my book was published by a publisher who disagreed with me on the title. The title that I had on my dissertation, which I wanted to have on the book, was Anticipating Armageddon. And the very first epigraph in the book starts off with a guy named Ernie Harmon, who commanded the first and the second and the third armored divisions in World War II. Ernie Harmon saying in the close of this quote, and we knew we would have to go back and do it again. Armageddon was just around the corner. They knew they would have to go back to Germany because they did not think that it was finished business. But clearly, the American Army Officer Corps also said, we were incompetent. We did not do a good job at the basics, at the blocking and tackling of logistics, rearmament, preparation for combat, and they looked at the experience that they had in the Meuse Argonne, and they said, never again. We're not going to do that again. And the core, I believe, was something called large formation handling. Can you, as an officer, do the things you have to do as a staff officer and as a unit commander to get a division of eh, 20,000 troops into combat at the right time, at the right place? The short answer was, in World War I, for the AF experience, it was not happy. It was not a good experience. It did identify, however, a critical need in the Army for more staff college graduates. We needed it so badly that we formed our own staff college in Langres, France, in order to generate some graduates that would fill in some of the gaps that the Leavenworth graduates, because there were so few, were unable to fill in. An interesting outlook here is that almost none of the division and corps commanders were Leavenworth graduates. Leavenworth had started with a decent military education course so late that if you were senior enough to command a division or a corps in the World War I, you had not been to Leavenworth. But the Leavenworth men, and this is a picture of Faye Brabson. I've got another photograph of him, which is in really bad shape, but it looks like he just walked out of central casting. Just amazing. Faye Brabson is an instructor who wrote a wonderful diary of the period. Unfortunately, he wrote it in some kind of weird shorthand thing, and it's almost impossible to decipher this stupid thing. But he said, you may not have ever seen an officer before, but if he was a former, a fellow West Leavenworth graduate, you would understand each other. It's what we teach now about the common requirements of doctrine, giving you a language that you can talk with other officers about. photograph of Langra, and one of my favorite photographs of some of the instructors at Langra in 19, late 1918. The Army General Staff College in Langra graduated more than 500 U.S. Army officers from a relatively short course. It was about a three-month course, and it was focused instruction. If you had reported in from a division as a G3, they would teach you how to be a G3, turn you around, and send you back to that division supposedly. Same thing for G4s in charge of the logistics, G2s in charge of intelligence, and G5s at the time were in charge of training. Nowadays, G5s are civil, military, or planning, depending upon how it's organized. And I was struck, the more research I do into the World War I perspective, the, the deeper my understanding becomes of the amazing amount of education and training that was occurring in France when units were not in the line. Langra, believe it or not, had a higher priority on officer assignments than combat. George C. Marshall sent several rather scathing letters to various leaders in the AAF saying, you're taking away our battalion commanders right before a major offensive. What are you thinking about? What they were thinking about was the big push in 1919. And that's why... Uh, that's why the no-notice armistice is such a shocker. Only about four or five days before the armistice, rumors started to circulate that the Germans were going to surrender. 
but the majority of officers up to early November, late October, the majority of officers knew and had been preparing for the big push in 1919 when the U.S. Army would field three million soldiers in Europe instead of the one million who were under arms in Europe at the end of the war. It, it, it is amazing when you look at the records how many officers and soldiers were serving in educational institutions behind the front lines in France and the U.S. Army in the United States was pushing people with a bare modicum of training to get on troop ships and come on over. The training occurred to a large extent in France and in combat. Which brings us to 1919. You'll see, a, I refer to this as the OES frequently, the officer education system. Before I counted the number of officers who actually went to France and tried to figure out how to account for some officers who went to France, but because they were German-speaking German-Americans, the French didn't want them, they had to come back. You would think that the majority of active duty Army officers were in France, but they were not. Only, depending on how you count it, only about 35 to 40 percent of the officers in the Army in 1917 actually ended up in France. They were kept back in the United States in order to push troops out. But the officer education system post-World War I was invented in Germany. You get this telegram from the War Department that says, hey, sort out the officer education system based upon your experience in, war, in the Great War, and we'll implement it when we come back. And that's what they did. Although the names changed as various officers came out of boards and were reassigned to other things, by early 1920, well, by late 1922, you had a system that in its essence existed through today. And I'll talk about what that system is in a minute. Harold B. Fisk, one of my favorites, nobody knows his name, but he was one of the essential officers who thought deeply about what officer education should be like and what it should teach, and he was very influential. It's also a little bit like Braxton Bragg. If you're a Civil War historian or an avid reader of Civil War stuff, you know Braxton Bragg was acknowledged throughout the Army for having argued with himself all the time. He would write a note as the commander of a unit to the post chief 4 saying how terrible the post chief 4 was. And then he would get out from his unit chair and go over to the chief 4 chair and sit in the chief 4 chair, which he was also, and write a nasty note back to him. This kind of thing happens in these boards. What I was struck by is that General McLachlan actually, uh, when the board results were finalized, he, the president of the board, said, I disagree with the board in these areas. It's a weird kind of different army where officers are able to talk to themselves in that kind of language rather than be worried about the fact that McLaughlin was a two-star and Fisk was a one-star. Didn't seem to work in those days. So the officer education system. Something called special service schools taught officers in almost every branch. So you had the artillery school at Sill, the cavalry school at Riley, and the Fort Benning School for Boys for the Infantry. There had been something like that earlier, but it really had been post schools. A certain cavalry post would teach its officers things that they thought they needed to know. But these schools taught the officers other than being in a unit. So the officer would come out of the unit and go to these schools, then return to a different unit, or perhaps go back to the same unit again. Generally speaking, you had a lieutenant's course and a captain's course. And they would teach what's called single service or single arm instructions. Now, there's a whole other discussion we can have about Pershing, the Springfield rifle, and open warfare or mobile warfare. And but I haven't written that book that much yet, so we'll have to wait for that. The general service schools, that's what tonight's discussion is about. A staff course at Leavenworth and a war college at Washington Barracks, currently Fort McNair. The branch schools were under the, under the uh, direction of the branch chief. Each branch had a major general known 
as a branch chief. So he had an infantry branch chief, and he ran the infantry school. There was oversight begun in the early 1920s. They were supposed to have an annual educational advisory board. Uh, as far as I can tell, there were two meetings, and then the third one was postponed, and we never went back to it again. So this thing got set in place, and then it became the role of the commandant or the chief of branch to alter the program of instruction as he saw fit. I found this, I had to change the slides for today, because I found this this morning over in the uh, AHEC archives. This is from 1930 and the War College. They broke it into two. We we're going to do preparation, and we're going to do conduct. Preparation and conduct. And they broke it almost, now, well, not quite 50-50, but the school year was broken into segments. One segment for preparation, taught before the conduct of war portion. And there you see, in teaching the art and science of war, what the War College thought they were going to do. And unless you want me to react really badly to the Italian food I had at supper time, we will not in here talk about how archaic the American army was. It was broke. It was small. Most of its effort was put into education. And it knew about mechanization, motorization, mobilization. It wasn't that we were just waiting around for the Germans to teach us how to fight. And now the bulk of the discussion, Leavenworth. Notice a little sleight of hand on this slide here. I hate anemic lightsabers. At Sam's, we call this a lightsaber. Notice something about that. I really feel, and I think it's substantiated from the record, that Leavenworth taught the science. We were talking about this at supper. In the 20s and 30s, I have found no single senior officer that I have seen telling a subordinate, we need to teach character. We need to teach the art of command. We need to teach them how to be good leaders. They instead acknowledged that by the age of 35 or 40, men were stuck. All you women will understand that. We don't learn. We don't change our character after we're in our 40s. They thought that was the truth. At Leavenworth in particular, they said, we're not going to worry about teaching command, which got us into a whole other discussion as well. We're not teaching the art, we're teaching the science. If you teach them the science, they'll, make, they'll think they're competent. If they think they're competent, they will have confidence, and they will then be able to do a decent job. Two special courses, a non-res course, lots of people in it. Not really sure what it did. Uh, it was mostly a primer for those who eventually would go to the main course. And then the National Guard. Special courses, short in length, taught to oh, a couple of dozen officers at a time. Um, really kind of hard to judge whether that had any value in the long run or not. Another important part of officer education in the interwar period is they broke it up. They said, the War College will teach field army and above operations and will teach general staff operations in Washington. Leavenworth, you've got division and corps, and if you have a little time in your budget, you may want to do some army level stuff, but the division is your heart and the corps is what you do with other available time. But nobody else in the Army is going to teach Division of Corps operations. Although for some reason I keep finding stuff from the infantry school talking about divisions. I've got to figure out what that really means. Again, those three at Leavenworth. This is interesting, I think. Congress required the Leavenworth to change its name from the Staff College, actually the Army School line, the Army Staff College, changed the name to the Army Command and General Staff School because they were afraid we weren't teaching command. And you get this pushback from Congress saying, you got to do something about this command thing. You know, we didn't have very good commanders in World War I. And the school consistently says, okay, fine, you changed your name. Thank you very much. But we're not going to change what we're doing. 
because we're teaching majors how to think like major generals and lieutenant generals because we're teaching them what the general has to know in order to make the right decisions. And we're also teaching you how to be a commander because a commander needs to know how to task his staff officers to get provide, the, provide the information that he needs to make decisions. The faculty at Leavenworth did not see much of a difference between the two elements of understanding. They were all based on that of a large formation. We'll talk about selection and evaluation in a minute. And I'll also talk about something called the GSEL, which is really a very strange story. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The hump of officers. You've all known since Sister Mary Elephant in second grade taught you about the Army in the interwar period that promotions were very slow. Of course, it's an Army tradition because that phrase comes from a song, Benny Havens, which 1840s, 1850s, I think. Sung at West Point all the time. The general staff eligible list reflected the National Defense Act of 1920, which said the United States will have a functioning general staff. It also said that unless you are on the general staff eligible list, and then you become anointed and you become on the general staff list, skip a word, only officers on the general staff list would ever make promotion to general officer. System of promotion is also different, and I'll talk about that in a minute. To get on the general staff eligible list, you had to be a decent standing graduate of Leavenworth. To get on the general staff list, you had to be a decent standing student graduate of the Army War College. Now, there's competition involved as well. But I'll talk about that in some detail in a minute. But the hump of officers. Roughly 15,000 commissioned officers in the U.S. Army during the interwar period, roughly. Of those 15,000, somewhere around 6,000 or 7,000 were in the hump. The hump is like the python, you know, the pig and the python. Python isn't the pig. Pig and the python. It's this thing coming through the officer's uh, experience channel, reflecting that in 1917 and 1918, because of the war, we commissioned a whole bunch of officers. And in 1920, 21, 22, we ran a series of boards that said, okay, you're good, we're going to leave you in the Army, you're not so good, you can go off and do something else. But they didn't decrement the uh, hump, because the hump is so huge, has so many officers in it, and so many high qualified officers, officers who were lieutenants in 1917, commanded battalions in 1918, that the hump is the source of what Sister Mary Elephant told you in second grade. Promotions are very slow. If you were in front of the hump, in other words, had been commissioned before 1917, you were making normal promotions. Almost similar to what we do today in terms of time and grade. But if you were in the hump, or too bad, behind the hump, you're going to spend 10, 12 years as a lieutenant or 10 or 12 or 14 years as a captain because all promotions were simply by seniority and time. No 5% above the zone, below the zone selections. No, unless it was very unusual, like Cushing, jumps from lieutenant colonel to two-star. It didn't happen. Nobody got promoted that way. You just waited your turn. And the hump was this huge thing right in the middle of this thing. And I put this in here not to show you it really, but this is the uh, blueprint of, where did my picture go? The blueprint of the main academic building at Fort Leavenworth. I wanted to put it in the book, but the people in charge at Fort Leavenworth said, you can't use that. You can't use blueprints. I said, what? This is from a reconstruction of 32 or so. What do you mean I can't use blueprints? The threat will use your blueprints and know where to plant bombs in the headquarters building. All right, okay. So that's a blueprint. Got all four floors on it. Yeah. So Leavenworth, faculty. Those of you who have experience in today's Leavenworth, We'll kind of wonder about this. 
Yeah, it's, you know, you'd really have to be quick to convince somebody that officers are specially selected for their skills to teach at Lebanon. Uh, I don't think anybody really fights with each other to get good officers as instructors because they, generally speaking, don't get successful officers as instructors. Uh, not everybody is a graduate of the Leavenworth course. Many are graduates of a distance learning kind of course. All active duty. Right now at Fort Leavenworth, we are at about 25% active duty and 75% civilian instructors. Throughout the interwar period, no civilians taught. A civilian would come in and give a lecture on something on occasion, but the instructors who were in the classrooms with the students were all active duty. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So in 1919, when Leavenworth starts back up again, Leavenworth was closed for the punitive expedition to get more officers out in the field and then remained closed during World War I. But we did have the War College, or the Staff College in Langra. 1919, there's 34 officers on the faculty and staff. By 1940, there's 79. And this one. This is a survey conducted by somebody on the general staff of officers in, did it in 28, I think, and 34, two different times. The best job in the Army was to be in D.C. That is so different than today. Now, the other services understand that you have to really populate your folks in the Pentagon with, with intelligent and experienced officers. The Army says, fight it. Don't ever accept it. You don't want to go to, uh, to Washington, D.C. It's a terrible assignment. Number one. Second best duty, according to the serving officers in the interwar period, instructor duty, primarily at War College in Leavenworth. Talk about another heart stopper. You know, if you want to cause an active duty American Army officer to have a heart attack, just tell him he's going to get assigned to Leavenworth as an instructor today. Now this, I find interesting for a couple of reasons. One, this is the experience of the faculty by year through the period. That's of the inaugural faculty, 34 officers, every single one had been in the AEF and had held significant jobs. I just can't imagine what a classroom would be like with a couple of instructors in there, one of whom had been a division chief of staff, and the other one had been, oh, the field artillery commander for a corps. And they're teaching a room full of captains who had been battalion commanders, company commanders in the Great War. That must have been interesting. And then this chart shows that there's a gradual falling off of the percentage of the faculty with AEF experience till it gets down to almost the average of the experience in the officer corps as a whole somewhere in the high 30%. And of course, the more you go to the right on this chart, the more some officers retire for chrono chronological age at 64, and they're no longer available to either be a student or to be an instructor. Now, this goes beyond G, because these guys, I have to get some more pictures, these guys who are running Leavenworth in 1919, 1914, 19, 1919 to 1920, had had big jobs. And they thought it was worthwhile to send these officers with tremendous experience and tremendous positive reputation, for the most part, to the schoolhouse. And you've got some famous names in there as well. Some infamous names in there as well. Short, commander at Pearl Harbor for the Army. Yeah. Court Marshal. Chaffee. You know, becomes sick and drops out of the armor developments business. But Chaffee is a huge name in armor developments in the 30s. And some guy named Leslie McNair. And there are other names in there you probably would know as well. One of the, there are two important things about this. The first is they come back as senior faculty. There's something called the Baltic Club, I think is the name of it. Uh, the Baltic Club were those officers who sailed on the SS Baltic with Pershing to go over to France and form the 1st Infantry Division. 
these guys are kind of a Baltic club too. They come back to Leavenworth as commandants, they come back to Leavenworth as school directors. And there is only one period between 1930 and 33 when none of the officers in charge had been in the inaugural faculty. The reason that I think is interesting is that the guys at the top, these are the faculty and staff from 32, teaching the guys at the bottom are using primarily doctrine that they wrote in 1919 and 1920. And I believe if you do the hard work of looking at every piece of doctrine and doing a page-by-page -page analysis, I believe it basically doesn't change. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. So who are the students? Today, there's something, a resident course, student population at Leavenworth is about 1,500, 1,400. They're dealing with 200. They're older, older by about a decade than the students are at Leavenworth right now. Now, the chief of staff of the Army, or put, let me get my power reference. The chief of staff of the Army has personal oversight of the list. It goes to him for approval. It goes to him from the branch chiefs, those major generals in charge of the various branches. They send up a selection list that says, I want these guys on it. They're going to put forward what they think are the best people because they are the future general officers. If you do not go to Leavenworth, you do not make general officer, period, end of statute. So it wasn't just something the Army invented. And that general staff eligible list comes up again. A moment aside for the Eisenhower selection myth. Eisenhower wrote in stories that I tell my friends. I guess we should have taken a little salt with the stories I tell my friends. That he was sent to Leavenworth through some weird connection of telegrams in the middle of the night, branch changes, and all this stuff because the chief of infantry didn't like him. But General Fox Connor loved him. Well... In the archives, there's the selection list for that year for infantrymen to attend Leavenworth. He's 28 of 94. And in pencil on this document, in pencil, there's this thing marked in by some staff officer that said, General Connor interested. And then he felt the need to write General Fox Connor because there's two Connors running around. One is spelled C-O-N-N-E-R. And that's Fox Connor, and the other Connor is spelled C-O-N-N-O-R. So there's no midnight telegrams. There's no branch transfer to Adjutant's General Corps or Signal Corps. There's none of that. He gets selected <coughs> by General Farnsworth to go to Leavenworth. Now, why does he want to tell that story? I don't know. And consistently through the period, the ladies of the officers, and this is not a sexist statement, this is simply a statement of fact, there were no female officers as students at Leavenworth in the period. The officers' wives are told that their family will return to a nice, easy life with their next troop assignment. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. That's hard to tell the U.S. Army in 1980 when we were in the Cold War, but it sure as hell is hard to tell them today that you'll get it easier when you graduate and go off to a troop unit. But in this case, the troop duty was enjoyable. It was fun. It was working from 8 to noon with a completely professional force. Oh, by the way, there's no conscripts running around. But the schools are where officers made their career. And here's the GESEL and the promotion system and the selection system. Class of 23-24, I love the legs crossed over one side or the other. And, of course, the Sam Brown belt. You'd look really good in a Sam Brown belt. <laughs> oh, maybe. Branch chief selects for general staff school, approved by the chief of staff. This is Akron City here. Order of merit. Consistently through the period, an order of merit list is developed and sent from the commandant of Leavenworth to the chief of staff of the Army. Number one. Number last. 
And now you get all kinds of weird things happen. And the weird things that happen in the record is this thing. They're supposed to place somewhere between one-third and one-half on the general staff eligible list when they kick them out the door and tell them to go have a good, good rest of their career. But if you count and look, almost everybody is on the general staff eligible list. Every class, maybe two or three, don't get on it because they get drummed out of the core for drinking or gambling. But people who survive the course are, mentioned, are put on the general staff eligible list. They even go back to other people who never went to the course, but they thought they were good guys, and they put them on the general staff eligible list. And then somebody notifies this as a problem to a member of the staff in the War Department, and he says, I don't think we should tell anybody about it. I see it having no purpose in the Army and the Officer Corps to talk about this at all. Another branch chief select for the Army War College. They're evaluated at the Army War College. Half are placed on the general staff list. The only real cut into a program is at the Army War College, except for the hump. And a lot of the knives in the darkness of the night and a lot of the sweat, blood, and tears comes out of the hump looking at their chances to go to Leavenworth starting in about 1938. Because that's when they're going to be the right age. Second Lieutenant World War I, they'll be about the right age to go to Leavenworth starting in 38 or so. And there is disaster predicted by everybody. It's in the journals. It's in the staff papers back and forth. Everybody predicts disaster. But the hump is eliminated by World War II. That 1 to 40 increase in the Army Officer Corps, the hump becomes something that is so inconsequential that I don't think anybody ever refers to it again. Promotion is by sheer seniority. Everybody is retired at age 64. There's no 20 years half pay, 30 years 75% pay. If you're 64, you're out. If you're less than 64, you're in. And pure seniority. Now, what do they teach? It's not a German doctrine. It's an American doctrine. Hugh Drum writes all kinds of stuff about that. It's divisional combined arms. It is mechanized, motorized, and accounts for close air support. And you get then all the historians who have developed their books and their careers based upon looking at the armor development in the U.S. Army, which was, to say the least, spasmodic, if not spastic. But in the schools here at the Army War College and at Leavenworth and at the Special Service Schools, they are teaching motorized brigades and motorized divisions and motorized corps in 1930, in 1925. They don't exist, but they're teaching it. They're teaching it because they know it's going to be part of the future. And notice at the top here, I've eliminated art. My contention is that this was a science course, how to do stuff. Okay, now we get the question of one year or two. Here's the changes, enough to make you grab a beer as you're trying to figure this out over the records. Because sometimes you have two different courses. In that period, they started with the School of the Line, which had 200 officers, and then the second year was only 100 officers because they were selected from the graduating class of the School of the Line. That ends completely by 1924. That's gone. Instead, what happens is every now and again, the general staff will say, we need better educated officers. And then they'll say, we need more officers, graduates. And they'll say, well, okay, just kidding. You know, we need better educated officers. It's all a question of who is going to populate the general staff requirements upon mobilization. Those studies are done at the Army War College by students for the G1 and the G3 of the Army. Something I'm writing about now. I wrote about it a little bit in the book but not too much. In fact, don't fret if you have a copy of the book and you notice that I refer to, in a footnote to the first chapter, I refer to chapter 10 of the book where this will be discussed, and then you realize that in the table of contents there's only nine chapters in the book. Yeah, 
funny things happen when you publish. Oh, it's too long. Cut it. Okay. They are, it is a f amazingly fresh and vibrant discussion in the professional journals about what the future is going to be like. We are experimenting with all that stuff. And yeah, well, maybe we don't get the tank very good, but every other single piece of equipment we develop is world class. People are laughing at each other in the journals. They're saying, you're going to have to motorize. We don't have enough horses in the United States anymore. Farmers are motorizing. Why can't we motorize? If the farmers are motorizing and getting rid of their breeding stock of horses, we're going to have to buy horses from the Mexicans. For the 1919 push, there is a something called the Caliber Board did an analysis of field artillery requirements right at the end of World War I. In there, they said, oh, by the way, with a very few exceptions, we were going to have motorization in 1919 of all of our artillery. If the war had not stopped, the United States would have been the first country ever to motorize all of its field artillery. Again, with a few exceptions, something called the accompanying gun. We are not asleep at the switch. We just have no money. By the way, if you want to study a comparative military that had money, look at the Italian Air Force in the 20s. Italy buys a world-class Air Force using 1929 technology. It doesn't do very well when it comes up against later technology in the war. So some countries can buy only one set of equipment going around. Others can buy more. In the World War I Museum in Kansas City, which if you ever go to Kansas City, you must go to the World War I Museum, They're, they run a timeline on the right-hand side of the museum. It's a big circle. And the timeline on the right-hand side of the museum is before the U.S. entry. And then they have something called the Horizon Theater where the United States enters the war. At the bottom of the timeline, before the United States comes in, there's a little blurb that says, in 1917, registered cars and trucks. In 1917, the United States of America had 84% of the world's registered cars and trucks. Germany had 94,000. The United States had something approaching 4.5 million cars and trucks. As they say in Band of Brothers, what were you thinking? We had General Motors. Now, this is the one I'm trying to sort out. I almost said trying to prove, but historians don't prove stuff. They just find it, bring it to our attention. The science of war. My favorite shot over here, if you take away the World War II helmets, it looks like a trench. My argument, I think, is going to be there is more continuity in the battlefield framework than there is difference. From 1918 to 1945, European theater. And there's something called successive stabilized fronts and breakthrough, which is spelled three different ways. And this is what I'm working on now. But I do know that the system of instruction, most of you have heard about learning types. The system of instruction at Leavenworth got to every learning type every week. They would start with a lecture. OK, I'm going to sit here and learn by listening. They would go to a conference. OK, I'm going to sit here by asking obnoxious questions of the speaker. They go to committee meetings, 10 students, two instructors. I don't think the War College meets that number now. I know Leavenworth doesn't meet that number. At SAMS, we have two instructors and 15 or 16 students. And then the essence, not physical training called horseback riding, the essence, problem-solving exercises. Individual work, graded, and the grade will make a difference where you are on the order of merit. This is a... If you can see that clearly, that's a wonderful picture of J. Lawton Collins when he was a division commander in the Pacific. 
think he was 32, something like that. And he looks just, it's an interesting photograph. Great depth of knowledge, practical application is the path to operational excellence. Written here at the War College, so it must be right. Very quickly, the applicatory method. This is a photograph from Time, or from Life magazine, 1942, showing a bunch of officers. And it's hard to tell it, off in the distance. Right there, there's a line of Dodge passenger cars. Brought them out by car. And I can talk about this in the Q&A if you want, but it was to develop those skills, the confidence, competence, and problem-solving skills at division and core, period, end of statement. And we took our horseback riding hippodrome and we turned it into a classroom. During World War II, yeah, we've talked about most of this. The bottom, Leavenworth grows exponentially. I'll show you what the exponential is in a minute. But this place, the Army War College, closes, shuts its doors. The Air, uh, Army Air Force, Army Air, the Air Service School at Maxwell closes. But Leavenworth does something different. First of all, Lieutenant General McNarney, who most of you have never heard of, was the Deputy Chief of Staff to George C. Marshall, an aviator. He comes out here on comes out here, goes to Leavenworth on an inspection trip in January of 43 and says, You guys have failed. I want you to do both air and ground. Of course, length and purpose changes. The faculty are no longer selected. The faculty are whoever they can get. They do have a wounded warrior program that brings officers who have been wounded in combat into Leavenworth as instructors, but they tend to lose them as soon as they're physically fit. Students? I'll show you the students here in a minute. And it's still teaching the science. Faculty rate, student rate goes from 2.8 to 7 to 1. They first try specialized courses. You look like a G2, I'll put you in the G2 course. They realize that when the unit gets the graduate, they're going to assign them to whatever they want anyway. But they then concentrate on Army ground forces, Army service forces, or Army air forces in a 10-week course that increases the reliance on the applicatory system of problem solving instead of decreasing it. I remember my days in Leavenworth, we did similar things, go out and do uh, tactical exercises with our troops. Here is an interesting photo. This is the staff and faculty in 43 way beyond 79. This is, a, looks like a pretty well normal size graduating class from Leavenworth until you realize it's photo one of seven. We're talking unbelievable growth. Some neat pictures from the Life magazine story. Grant Hall is still there. It's now the, you can't publish that blueprint building. So here we have the long course graduates, first or two year, for one year or two year courses taught between 1919 and 1940. I looked at the European theater in World War II. Those are the percentage of graduates who filled those positions. Notice senior officers. Divisions in World War II, at least in Europe, had no, no, underline no, is in zero. I found one. Graduate of a long-term course at Leavenworth who ended up as a division staff officer. In World War I, the commanders were not staff officer trained, staff officers were. In World War II, the commanders were staff officer trained. Their subordinates, who had been lieutenants in 1939, their subordinates were not trained at a long course. They were trained, however, in the short courses. 2,500 approximate graduates from the 20s and 30s still young enough to be available for duty. Between February of 41 and May of 46, Leavenworth graduates 16,000 officers. And they teach it using this form of warfare. 
Most cases, you will start with a stabilized front. Both sides will attempt to conduct a breakthrough and turn that into an exploitation and get into mobile warfare where decisive victory lies. And it is again consistent through the period that they, when they talk about it in the journals, they don't quite know how to do that. Book two. And we'll end with Ernie Herman. I did not pay him any money to make that statement. It was made when I was in high school. So, questions or comments? And all of these guys graduated from Leavenworth as well. Just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Jeff in the back if you want to grab him. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, this may be outside the scope of your work, or you might know somebody who's done some work on it. Uh, I'm wondering what would happen to all these officers after they got out and took that training back into the civilian world. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the growing gap military civilian and it's usually in term we think of the 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 grunts in world war ii learning the value of service sacrifice teamwork uh, and whatnot but i've got to wonder about the impact of all these highly trained people who have a common background moving into the economy and taking positions in the civilian world i, I kind of wonder i don't know and i don't know anybody who's done the number crunching to answer that question but the Army shrank a lot in 46, 47. Um, but the Army retained officers at a higher rate than they retained soldiers. Something they also did after World War I. So many of those guys probably stayed on. You go through competitive boards process to stay on. I thought you initially were asking about what happened to officers who were 64 and retired. That's a pretty sad story because the majority of them die in the next couple of years. They go off and run a business, a bank somewhere, and then you'll see their obituary, heart attack. Over what there. Lindsay? Are you doing this or am I doing this? <laughs> Shoot you with my lightsaber. Good evening, my name is Ray Porter. My, my direct question is, very interesting, thorough job of looking at the systems, the statistics, and the processes, but not too much on the person-to-person -person action. So, but let me explain the reason of the question. Uh, my grandfather was a graduate of the two-year course in 35, went to the War College in 37, and back there to teach. Uh, and listening to him and his compatriots uh, talk, uh, and I refer to two slides. You had one earlier that said the big three outcomes of Austro education system, uh, but you didn't have anything personal. You didn't have uh, any discussion of, didn't have a discussion of what they taught each other. And then you talk in the uh, later slide about teaching the science of war, but not the art. And that doesn't account for the, the seminars, the committee times they had on Friday and the discussions they had with each other. It was, um, it was my grandfather's feeling from listening to his war stories, and unfortunately, uh, he died the year I started college, and I listened to these boring war stories my dad and grandfather told for years at the dinner table. I'd love to be able to recount all those now, but uh, they learned an awful lot from each other. There was an informal mentoring system where they learned and taught. One of the, one of the outcomes of, that, of, the big, of the education system, you had the big three, was they got to know each other. The experience of the officer corps, the, the guys that became the first generals picked uh, their chiefs of staffs and they became the next generals and tremendous knowledge, personal reputation, uh, these guys, and they taught each other a lot. They grabbed the people they knew and they brought them along with each other. And so I wonder if in all your, and that's the background of the question, but the question again is, what's the, what's the informal learning impact on the development of the officer corps for World War II? I, I think, I think it's probably overemphasized. And the reason I say that is when you look and say, okay, well, who really picked the division commander to be the division commander? And how many officers was he allowed to carry off with him? 
that data point is available by looking at the rather horrible job that we did with a replacement organization. The fact that we had to go out and strip cadre and strip divisions for the, almost for the entire war. Um, Omar Bradley, whose shameless book club, Omar Bradley, who's in here in the top picture as the commander of the 82nd Division, 82nd Infantry Division going to Leavenworth for a new divisions course, I think he was able to take his driver, um, an artillery officer, and an aide. The artillery officer, I think, was a full colonel. When he transferred one, one division to another, 28th to 82nd. And then you look at who selected them, who actually was the guy who selected officers for positions, and a guy named Leslie McNair comes up. McNair did more, you need to go here, you need to go there, than Marshall. And we're still looking for his little black book, by the way. So. Now, I shouldn't underestimate, because it's in my slide, slides here, discussions at the club. This is very much a social group of officers. At 16,000 commissioned officers in most of the period, they're not going to know each other, but they're going to know a lot of officers of their branch. And then they will know by reputation, you know, a couple of concentric rings like on a target. You really know these guys well. These guys went with you to Leavenworth or Benning. These guys went with you to the War College. These guys you served with in Hawaii. But they're all going to get promoted in the same day, and they're all going to retire at age 64. Another thing we can talk about. Other questions? Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Where? where uh, I'm, I'm curious. Where is the city of Longres in France located? Longres? Mm -hmm. uh, it's still there. I haven't gone there yet. Um, oh. No. Where did they go? I'm sorry. Uh, it's near Chamon. Chamon was the headquarters of the AAF, and basically it's in it's in either Western Lorraine or Southern Champagne. I think it's in Southern Champagne. Longre. No, no, I mean you said it's near the Chalon. And Chamon. Chamon was the headquarters area, and basically the French gave the AAF a whole bunch of worthless terrain and said, have a nice time. And so they, uh, Langro was in a abandoned German, or abandoned French infantry concern, and uh, these huge old buildings. And the first couple of classes had no chairs, no tables, no nothing. They built it from scratch. Yes, sir. I know both of these guys. This, this is the hazards. They're both so, SAMS uh, graduates. Hold on a second. They're both SAMS graduates. i got to get my SAMS slide in here. So if you were uh, General Dempsey, Chief of Staff, uh, JCS, what would you do with the hump today? We have uh, two wars with a depth of experience. Uh, and I heard stories of the officers coming out of combat from downrange more experienced than the civilian instructors at Leavenworth, oh. and which almost kind of disheartens them they have high expectations when they arrive, and, and those kind of get ruined when they show up. Um, the hump was an intractable problem because any solution to the hump would destroy a valuable group of officers. And if you flatten the hump so that people behind the hump would get promoted at a normal rate, you would lose 5,000 commission officers. All of them had been through the special service schools. Many of them had been to Leavenworth, well, not Leavenworth yet. But it was anticipated that, um, I think 37 was the last time the War College looked at the problem. It was anticipated that sooner or later you were going to have superannuated second lieutenants at the age of 55. And sooner or later it was just going to be so bad that they just would have to stop and do something serious and drastic. But none of the chiefs of staff wanted to, to be the guy who got stuck with that. The second one was, yeah. 
I think we're not going to have it because we're going to ignore it. And whatever current chief of staff, whatever he says about not having hollow units, well, I don't know. A hollow unit is pretty good at training NCOs and officers at certain tasks. It's not great as a readiness thing, but if you're going to have tiered readiness, are you going to have everybody ready at the same rate? Questions yet to be determined. One more. Well, as I pondered this question there, I think uh, my colleague over here kind of stove some of the direction that I was going remember, to go. Remember, Barrett, remember, we're still making out the graduate the GSEL list for your class, so <laughs> order of merit still counts. And, and that's a fine point. Um, but as you anticipate um, perhaps downsizing the military, you know, in the future, you know, as an as historian, a scholar, do you, what are you, what are you informing or the, the Samsters of today about how should they change the culture of the military? Should they change the culture of the military based upon your research? Or is that something that's, uh, that society should do? Well, I didn't talk about the horse cavalry. Um, the horse cavalry is, I think, a, a counter to my relatively good news story about Lower. Uh, and the, the flag-waving, slogan-shouting guy was not a guy was not chief of cavalry, it was a brigadier general by the name of Hawkins. And Hawkins comes out, uh, right after he retired, comes out and starts writing articles for cavalry journal. And they're all about, we've got to keep the horse. The truck will never be good enough cross country, the horse will always be a better animal for cross country transport, all this stuff. And he gets so rabid that he writes an editorial about a command post exercise, in which he said that nobody in this command post exercise that he saw was an observer at. Nobody got out and looked at the troops and see what they were doing. Like, wait a minute, General. There are no troops in a command post exercise. What do you want them to do? So th there will always be a cadre who say over my dead body. And in the 20s and 30s, occasionally there was a dead body because somebody would say, you're no longer the chief of infantry, you need to move out. You're no longer the commandant of Leavenworth, you need to move out. You know. But changing a culture, I think changing a culture is the same as a revolution in military affairs. The real revolutions in military affairs, the ones that last and make a difference, and the real cultural changes in the military come from outside. And they came from outside in 1918 in the Meuse Argonne for this generation of officers. Except for Hawkins, who was wandering around lost. In the, he was actually lost as a division chief of staff it sounded like a really bad rotation at one of the training centers. In the middle of the Meuse Argonne, he goes out of, the, out of the division command post, which is where the chief of staff is supposed to be, to go deliver a message to a regiment that had not attacked. He disappears for 24 hours in the middle of a battle. Like, what are you people thinking? Not a lower Other questions? Oh, yes, sir. There is, by the way, a German-American historian named Jörg Vollmer who completely disagrees with me on everything. Uh, but fortunately, he's not here tonight. So. Yeah. Uh, Chris Reed, student here at the, uh, the War College. In, in uh, listening to you and also in some of my own research, the Army in this period, uh, the regular Army appears to be a very highly selected, very small, intensively educated and graded elite and there's, there's this selection process occurs up through its ranks. Um, and it seems to me after World War II, the uh, professional military education system goes the other direction. Uh, till now, every, you know, everyone goes to school. There is, it's not used as a selection process, and it, it maybe lacks the academic rigor uh, in, in the opinion of some. So what happened to cause that, and, and is that for good or, or for ill? We were talking about this at supper. The, I'm not the expert. A guy named Mike Stewart is the expert who's got a PhD dissertation out on CGSC, Leavenworth, from 45 to Goldwater Nichols. Uh, his story is populated by some human beings that don't exist in my story. Civilian instructors. 
you know, before you write your congressman and tell them to abandon that, I'm a civilian instructor, so I don't want to lose my job. But civilian instructors, straight line increase. It's not, you know, here's one, here's another one. It's once they get their foot in the door, we get more and more civilian instructors. If you're teaching art, maybe. If you're teaching science, then as Barrett said it, or no, you said it, I think. Officers who are recently retired have a shelf life of maybe five or six years before they're no longer relevant, or at least no longer relevant in the eyes of the students. Um, another thing that changed in the early 50s was the pentomic division fiasco. Uh, and we didn't know what the science was because we didn't know what atomic weapons would do on the battlefield, but we thought they were going to be there all the time. Well, they haven't had, we haven't had that, so now we've swung back the other direction. The current, or the, let's see, former twice over chief of staff who wanted 100% of officers to go to military education level Leavenworth. If you, if you look at, not the SAM slide, but if you go back to the GESEL slide, do, 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 do. What I really found crazy about this is that once you looked at the selections, they weren't at the numbers that they were told. So the officer corps writes articles in infantry magazines saying, oh my God, I'm behind the hump or I'm in the hump. I'm never going to make the GESEL. I'm never going to be a general officer. I'm going to retire as a lieutenant after, at age 64. And there's this hubbub, particularly as the hump starts to arrive at Leavenworth. There's a, just this outcry from the officers. And there's a staff officer in the War Department who says, well, I guess we probably shouldn't even say anything about it. Let's just ignore it, because we're probably going to be in a war here soon with Germany, because we left that unfinished. So let's just ignore it. And there's a couple of chops on it from senior guys that say, yeah, good idea. Let's not even talk about it. It'll, it'll go away. Well, yeah. What was interesting about this, from my perspective as a current instructor, is that when you OML, you get students' attention. And they work harder. Almost everybody graduates from CGSC. Almost everybody goes before the hump. And almost everybody graduates. But they all think it's their chance to excel. The OER system was so inflated that, and there was no selection for battalion or brigade command. You brigades were commanded normally by brigadier generals, so you had the general officer selection to get in there. But Omar Bradley gets his infantry battalion in Hawaii because another guy goes to Leavenworth. And the division commander says, Brad, you've been working real hard as a staff officer. If you want to take a battalion and relax for a while. He goes, okay, boss. Takes a battalion. It's, it's such a different army. It's 180 degrees out of whack culturally. The cultural aspects of this army that I'm looking at here is so different than the cultural aspects of the army I was in for 24 years that it's almost, sometimes it's just amazing to, to find this. And then you find the smoking gun. It's like, okay, you got staff officers who are spreading traffic around and notes to each other. It says, we've identified a problem, but we can't fix it. So we'll ignore it. And we'll end it there.